The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents... Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is an absolute truth, and you know what's more? If you seek for it, you will find it. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Millennium of Prophecy video series. And the study tonight is dealing with Back to Jerusalem. It's going to be talking about the keys to unlocking the mysteries of prophecy. A lot of people feel like the Bible is a mystery that cannot be understood. I'm here to tell you that there are symbols in the Bible, and some are difficult, but God does want you to understand. Well, let's get into our questions for tonight. Question number one. We got a lot of material to cover, and this is a great lesson, so I need to move along. How much of the Scripture are we commanded to believe? Answer, believe all that the prophets have spoken. And then we go to 2 Timothy 3, 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Bible, as we know it, it it's a Latin word, biblios. It means the book. It is the books, the book of books, so to speak. It's divided in the New and the Old Testament. Now, when I grew up here in New York City, my father and mother divorced when I was three years old, and my father complained that I was not getting any religious instruction. My mother, who was Jewish, said, uh, okay, and she sent me to synagogue. And, of course, they believed in the Old Testament and uh, some of those sacred writings. Uh, when I went to live with my father, he sent me to Catholic school. They used to kind of go to each other that way. And so I've had a very well-rounded religious instruction. But I, I thought it was very interesting that... Uh, you know, I studied with one group and they said just the Old Testament. And then I went to some Protestant churches and they supplied just New Testaments in their churches. Most Protestants don't believe that, but some do. And I want you to know today, the whole thing comprises the Bible. The New and the Old Testament. You cannot understand the prophecies by throwing away the New Testament. Look here. Here's the book of Matthew. This is where the New Testament begins. This is the Old Testament. If you throw away your Old Testament, you're throwing away the the better part of the keys that unlock the prophecies and three-quarters of the Scripture. Ten percent of everything Jesus said, he's quoting the Old Testament. And keep in mind, when Christ talked about the Scripture, when Christ used the Scriptures, there was no New Testament. The New Testament is the words of Jesus and the apostles that were recorded later. So it's very important that we recognize all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and that we utilize it in our study. We're going to do that. That's our approach during this program. Whom did Jesus say that the Scriptures and the prophecies reveal? Answer, Luke 24, verse 27. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the Scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, remember, there's no New Testament. And here he's showing from the whole Old Testament the things concerning himself. He is all through the Bible in the New and the Old Testament. The next part of that answer is John 5, 39. And it says, Search the Scriptures, for they are they that testify of me. Now, you know, the stories in the Bible are all little miniature pictures of the coming Messiah. Let me give you a couple of examples. Joseph. How many brothers were there? Twelve brothers. Joseph was one of them. Just like Jacob had 12 sons, Jesus had 12 apostles. Joseph was sold for the price of a slave. They took away his clothes. They dipped it in blood. They put him in a hole where there was no water, but he came out alive. Christ was sold by Judas for the price of a slave. They took away his clothes that were splattered with his blood from a beating, yet he still forgave those who persecuted him, and Joseph forgave his brothers who sold him. And I could take that story for the rest of the night. You've got... Abraham and Isaac going up the mountain together to sacrifice. The father offering the son. For God so loved the world, he gave his son. Isaac's got the wood on his back. Jesus had the cross on his back. And finally, they find a ram with its horns caught in a thicket, a ram with a crown of thorns. 
There's so many parallels in the Old Testament that help us recognize when Jesus came who he was. Thousands of examples. So the scriptures testify of him. The next part of this answer is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And those things are transpiring right now. The Bible is a revelation of Jesus. All right, let's go to the next question. What is another name that is used in the Bible for Jesus? Answer, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. I'm sorry, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. One of the titles for Christ is the Word. Next part of that is John 1.14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God the Son incarnate. That means in the flesh. He took on the form of a human. Now, there's three reasons that Christ came down. Came to show us what the Father is like. You remember at the end of his ministry, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The world is in a great deal of darkness. There's a lot of misunderstanding about who God is, who is the Father. A lot of people picture this big uh, policeman up in the sky with a billy club waiting to zap us when we do something wrong. Jesus came to show us that the Father loves us. He came to demonstrate and reveal the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Second reason Jesus came, he came to show us how to treat each other and how to live, how to walk. He says, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done. So he lived as a man. He went through the same experiences we go through. And don't forget this. Jesus never used his own miraculous power for selfish purposes. He always used it to heal, to feed, to save others, okay? He struggled with thirst just like you and I. He got tired and fell asleep in a boat. He lived among men. He showed us how to forgive and to love those who mistreat us. So as our example, third reason Jesus came is our, as our substitute. He took what we deserve, and he offers us what he deserves. He takes our weakness, and he gives us his strength. He takes our sin, and he gives us his purity. He made this incredible transition with us. He traded places with us, our substitute. Those are the three reasons. Now, he is called the Word. Jesus was the Word of God incarnate. And that's why when people say, oh, boy, you know, I wish I could see Jesus. If I could walk with Jesus, you've got the most important thing about what came to earth right here. The Word of God became flesh. Christ is recorded in these pages. He is the Word that became flesh. Okay, let's move along now to our next question. What kind of people did God use to write the Bible? Answer, say it with me. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Some people say, well, you know, how can we trust that the Bible is not just made up? How do we know these folks didn't have too much lobster for dinner and then just have wild dreams and write it all down? Well, the Bible tells us these were people who had consecrated their lives to God. It was holy men and women. You know, there's the prayers of different women in the Bible recorded as well. The Bible not only was written by holy men, but the Bible makes holy men and holy women. It's like Dwight Moody used to say, either sin will keep you from the Bible or the Bible will keep you from sin. The reason this is called Santa Biblia, Holy Bible, it's a sacred book written by holy men. There have been attempts made through the ages to extinguish the scriptures, and they failed. The Bible is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. Eternal life comes from knowing the Lord. John 17, verse 1 through 3, you read that. How was Jesus known? In the breaking of bread. Now, one of the phrases that's often used in the scripture for the Bible is, this is the bread of life. Some of you have heard that hymn, Break thou the bread of life, O Lord, unto me. Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. You know, sometimes you might be thinking, I don't understand the Bible. It's, it's complicated. How many of you remember the story where the disciples brought their bread to Jesus? They only had five loaves and a couple of fish. They gave it to Jesus. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it back to them, and it multiplied in their hands. That's what will happen for you if you take it to the Lord. When you open your Bible, ask him to guide you in your study. How important should Bible study be to the Christian? Job chapter 23, verse 12, I have esteemed the words of his mouth, what's the answer? More than my necessary food. Now, if you've got to hasten out the door and you've got a choice between your Bible reading 
and your raisin bran. Fiber is very important, but it's not going to save your soul when temptation comes later in the day. We need to take advantage of the Word of God that He's made available. Psalms 119, 105. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's Word will guide you in the direction that you need to go. It will give you purpose in life. Question number seven. Who helps us understand the Bible? John 16, verse 13. When He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. So who do we need to understand the Bible? The Holy Spirit will guide us. That's the same as John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, He shall teach you all things. And then we have one more in this answer. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. We speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. The Holy Spirit will teach you. Now, will the Holy Spirit ever teach anything contrary to the Word of God? I've run into people before and they say, well, Doug, I know that you go by the Bible. That's the old letter. It's dead. That's old. I go by the Spirit. It's fresh. It's new. And they say that if the Spirit of God tells you something and it's conflicting what the Word of God says, you need to go with the Spirit. Oh, that's very dangerous because you could be led by all kinds of different things you call the Spirit. A lot of people say they're Spirit-led and they're really just being led by their own inclination. And the Bible tells us, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance the things that I have said. The Holy Spirit is not going to conflict with the Word of God. Amen. They will be united. They are one, okay? So don't fall for that very popular deception that the Spirit's going to teach something contrary or are diametrically opposed to the Word of God. There's a perfect unity there. Pray for God's Spirit as you study His Word. Next question should be number eight. What must I do to be certain the Holy Spirit is guiding me in my Bible study? Not only should we pray for the Spirit, Luke 11 verse 9 tells us, And I say unto you, ask, pray, ask, and it shall be given unto you. Furthermore, we read in Luke chapter 11 verse 13, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? You know, a lot of people say, I don't understand the Bible, and they just walk away from it. Did you really hunger and thirst? You know, I, I've written several books, not just my testimony, and people often ask me to autograph my book. I usually scribble my name where it's not legible. And then I put my favorite scripture, Jeremiah 29, 13. It says, you will search for me, and you'll find me. When you search for me, who knows the rest of that? With all of your heart. You need to make an investment in knowing God. And I'll tell you, friends, if anything's important, knowing God and knowing the purpose of life, that's important. Amen? Amen? You know, I'm persuaded a person cannot be happy unless they understand three basic truths. We need to know something about where we've come from. We need to know something about what we're doing here and where we're going. That's why prophecy in the Bible is so essential, is because people cannot be secure. I know, I grew up basically an atheist, and I was miserable because I didn't know where I came from. I was hearing all kinds of things, and I didn't know what I was doing here, and I had no idea where I was going, and I knew I was only here for a little while, and I had no idea why. A lot of unhappy people out there because they don't understand those three basic essentials. The Bible will give you all of those answers. That will give you a peace that passes understanding. It's worth praying for. It's worth searching for. Amen. All right, number John 17. Got a third part of this uh, answer here. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine whether it be of God. So we need to ask. We need to be willing to do. Some people don't understand because they have no intention of doing what God wants them to do. One of the hardest things that Jesus wrestled with during his earthly life was in the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed to the point where he was perspiring with blood mixed in his perspiration. And you know what he said in that prayer? If it's possible, Lord, that this cup, this separation from you, this sacrifice, if there's any other way, let it pass. But if not, not my will your will be done. 
The key to happiness and victory is for each of us to say, Lord, I am willing to do your will. Before the seminar is over, we'll teach you a little chorus that talks about being willing to do God's will. Number nine, how does prayerful study of the Word help us? Psalm 119, verse 11, Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin. I've told you that the Word of God will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Word of God. There is a degree of conviction. When you read the Bible, it might point out something in your life that's not healthy, that might make you uncomfortable, but if you cooperate with God, you'll, you'll have peace. So the Word keeps you from sin or sin keeps you from the Word. Friends, if you knew that there was a red button, little secret weapon red button that you had to press once a day, and you knew if you pressed that button, you were going to live forever in paradise. Would you make every effort to press that button once a day? Would you? Yes. Friends at home, would you make that effort? Want me to tell you what that secret weapon is? Now, I don't believe we're saved by works. I believe that we are saved by faith. But you know where faith comes from? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans tells us, okay? That secret button is a relationship with the Lord from a personal devotion life knowing how to read the Bible and getting to know God through it. Not only that, you'll understand the prophecies. The Bible tells us that we need to put on the whole armor of God. And what was the, one of the most important parts of that armor? It says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We do battle with the devil every day. And a lot of people are easily overcome. The only offensive weapon in the armor of God that you find there in Ephesians chapter 6 is the sword. What did Jesus use when the devil came to tempt him in the wilderness? I'm talking to some of you that know that story. Three times the devil tried to tempt Christ, and all three times, what did Christ say? It is written, it is written, it is written. Quoted the Bible all three times, and you know he quoted all three times from the book of Deuteronomy. And so if the Old Testament was good enough for Jesus, then it's good enough for me too. What do you say? I've hid your word that I might not sin. Jeremiah 33, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things. If you call, does, he, does God lie? He said, call and I will answer you. Ask, you will receive. And not only that, I will show you great and mighty things. God will give you profound, brilliant revelations that will explode in your mind with new light that will just daze you with the, the, the things that he wants to share with you. Now I want to move on to uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 4. And it says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we might have hope. God wants us to be educated. He wants us to know what's going on. He wants us to have hope. You know, the Bible tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Bible will increase your intelligence, not diminish from it. James 1, 5, if any of you lack, what? Wisdom, let him ask of God and it shall be given him. Now, I believe what God says. Do you? He says, ask me, I'll give you wisdom. This is how we must approach the prophecies if we're going to understand them. What is the method that we use for studying the Bible? Isaiah 28, verse 10, for precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And I want to go now to the next one, 1 Corinthians 2.13, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. When you study the Bible, it's important to compare Scripture with Scripture. Amen. Some people read one Scripture and they build a whole church, a whole denomination on one Scripture, and they get these kooky, eccentric doctrines because they're not using a multitude of Scriptures and laying a good foundation. Jesus said, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let something be established. And so what we're doing in this seminar is we're not going to try and get you to believe the conclusion of some prophecy on some ambiguous, nebulous scripture out there. We're going to give you lots of evidence for your conclusions. That's why we're inviting you to ask questions so that we can come to accurate conclusions. Do you think it's God's will that there's this much confusion and diversity in the name of the Bible and God? That there's so much division? No, so much of it comes from people just taking one passage or one scripture and building on the sand. We need to compare scripture with scripture. The next one says 2 Peter 1.20, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. 
Now, sometimes I've been at Bible studies where someone says, well, I know what this scripture says to you, but to me, I think this scripture says, oh, come on, God is not that way. Truth is absolute. People say, well, this is your truth, and this is my truth, and we're living in this world where everything is relative. That's very dangerous, friends. That's not how God operates. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is an absolute truth, and you know what's more? If you seek for it, you will find it. There's a promise, but you need to search. Are you aware that nowhere in the Bible are we told to read the Bible? But it does say in the Bible, search the Bible, study the Scriptures. It's not a novel. It's not something you go through once and say, that was interesting. It's on a continual basis we mine into the depths of the Word of God. I know a man who would read it through about six times a year, and he lived into his 90s, and he got new things out of it every time. Martin Luther said, you should read the Bible something like the way you pick apples. He said, first you go to the trunk and shake the whole tree. So then you go and you shake the branches. Then you get out on the limbs and you shake the limbs. And then pretty soon you're looking behind the leaves and the twigs. Get the overview. Read the whole book. And then you can start breaking it down and looking at some of the other particulars. What will studying the Scriptures do for us? 2 Timothy 3.15 Thou hast known the Holy Scriptures that are able to make you wise unto salvation, which is through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The Scriptures will give you wisdom and the Scriptures are the medium through which God gives us the information that can save us for eternity. I think that's good news. According to Jesus, where do we find the truth? What's the answer there? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Where is the truth about Jesus revealed the most clearly? It's in the Word of God. And then John 17, verse 7, Thy word is truth. People say, well, you know, obviously the Bible is such an old book, it's been changed, and we don't know what it really said originally. Not so. I used to use that same argument when I was an atheist. Back in 1947, down at the lowest point on the earth by the Dead Sea, 1,300 feet below sea, uh, sea level, a Bedouin shepherd boy was looking for some missing goats. He noticed these caves that were not very far. It's by a town called Qumran, not very far from a main highway. It'd been there for 2,000 years. He took a rock and threw it up in the cave, wondering if his goats had wandered in there or just doing what boys do. And he heard a clattering, breaking sound that did not sound like rock. He scampered up into the cave, and inside that cave, he found all of these ancient clay pots that had these leather scrolls. Inside were parts of the Bible. They discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because of the dry climate, they had been preserved almost perfectly for over 2,000 years, some of them. Every part of the Old Testament, except the book of Esther, in part or in whole, was found. Archaeology continues to support the fact that the Bible is dependable. It's the most, now it's the most respected, didn't always be that way, but the more research, the more digging they've done, the more they've come to find that the Bible continues to be the source book for ancient history, and it is very dependable. The things that they still have not proven, I trust, will be proven. How shall we test all the religious teachings and doctrines of the Bible? How do we know what we're reading, if it's dependable, if it's true? It says they received the Word with all readiness of mind, and they searched the Scriptures daily. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. It's not just talking about the bread that you eat. It's saying, give us our spiritual food, the bread of life, Jesus, on a daily basis that we might be nourished spiritually. They search the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. So we need to do it for ourselves. You know, we live in a very religious country here in North America, but I think we have a problem. We depend on the priest and the rabbi and the pastor, and I'm including myself, I'm a pastor, to give us some dessert once a week, and we don't know how to feed ourselves. We want to be spoon-fed a little bit. We want to be entertained by the minister, but we've not learned to feed ourselves. And when the storm comes, and you know the Bible tells us there's a storm coming. Jesus said the wise man builds on the rock, and when the storm comes, his house stands. What's the rock? He that hears these words of mine and does them. The fool builds on the sand, and when the storm comes, his house disintegrates. You notice something? The storm comes to the wise man, and the storm comes to the fool. 
The difference is, are we building on the rock? Are we listening to the Word of God? We must know the Word of God for ourselves. Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back with this week's special free offer. When Christ comes again, it's called the second coming. You know what that means? There was a first coming. His own people, my people, had the scriptures. They had the prophecies about the Messiah and his coming. But did the majority of his people recognize him when he came the first time, or did they misunderstand the prophecies about his first coming so they were not prepared? Is there a chance that God's people with Bibles, with scriptures, could misunderstand the prophecies about his second coming? Journey back through time to the center of the universe. Discover how a perfect angel transformed into Satan, the arch-villain. The birth of evil, a rebellion in heaven, a mutiny that moved to earth. Behold the creation of a beautiful new planet and the first humans. Witness the temptation of evil. Discover God's amazing plan to save his children. This is a story that involves every life on Earth. Every life. The Cosmic Conflict. If God is good, if God is all-powerful, if God is love, then what went wrong? Available now on DVD. Thank you for joining us for this broadcast. If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at amazingfacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents, Central Study Hour, Everlasting Gospel, Bible Answers Live, and Wonders in the Word. You'll also find a storehouse of biblical resources geared towards answering some of your most difficult questions. And our online Bible school is just a click away. One location, so many possibilities. Amazingfacts.org. Hi friends, the Lord has changed my life in amazing ways that I still find hard to believe. The good news is that He also has a great plan for your life. It was in the Bible I discovered the meaning, purpose, and direction for life. And if you haven't yet, I'd like to invite you to become acquainted with God's plan for your life in this miraculous book. To help you better understand the Word of God, I'd like to send you this free gift. It's a simple study guide entitled, Is There Anything Left You Can Trust? You'll enjoy this fascinating study regarding the miraculous nature of God's Word. To get your own copy, just call the toll-free number on your screen and ask for offer number 103. If you prefer, you can simply write us at Amazing Facts, offer number 103, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Until we meet again, remember John 8.32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen, and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. The preceding was a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated.